Welcome to Model Steam Engine's Top Tip Time, Part 61. This episode features clips from a series I made a while back called Completing a Stuart Triple Expansion Engine. My friend Andrew is making a Stuart Triple Expansion Engine, but he's doing it from the castings right from the beginning. It took me quite a while, to say the least, to rebuild this engine. I'm looking forward to watching the progress of Andrew's engine. It really is not an easy job. If you want to see the complexity of the machining process for one of these engines, please have a look on my friend Andrew's YouTube channel. The address is on screen at the moment. If you're thinking about building one of these engines, I do suggest that you watch Andrew building one first. I don't think my lifespan and sanity would allow me to build one of these engines using raw castings. Time to get on with the show. Looking at the engine on the bench, the first impressions are quite good. It would appear to be very well made. And it does look fairly complete. Most of the parts seem to be present. When I rotate the crankshaft, everything does what it's supposed to do, but everything is loose. In this series, I intend to finish this engine to a good standard. In my opinion, from what I can see here, most of the hard work seems to have been done. The water pump and air pump are not present. And yesterday, I gave Stuart Models a call and ordered the parts. I can already see that there is a lot of work to do. No time like the present, so I'll start by blowing the dust away. This engine's been in dry storage for 26 years, so there isn't much oil there, and luckily the airline blows most of the dust away. Usual health and safety warning when doing jobs like this, wear some PPE. Eye protection and a breathing mask is recommended. By showing you this in close-up, you can see the standard of engineering that's made it possible for this engine to be as far on as it is. A Stuart triple expansion engine, particularly like the one that I have built by Ronnie Mall that's in a glass case, is an absolutely wonderful engine. The design, the style, the curves and the straight bits are all really, really good. That's most of the dust removed. To take it to the next level, I'm going to use some of this stuff, WD-40. And here I'm spraying the last contents of this tin, which is almost empty, over as much of the engine as I can. I'm not using it to disperse any water because the engine's very dry. I'm using it as a cleaning agent. And I've exchanged the airline for a toothbrush. This is my electric toothbrush, but it's not working very well. Should I send it back for a replacement? Well, possibly not. After using this non-electrical toothbrush, I've removed most of the grime that was there to start with. I'm now going to use panel wipe, which is naphtha, to remove some more of the dirt and grime. Here, I'm using an ordinary toothbrush, which is actually better, I suppose, because it's got more bristles. I do believe the engine's looking better already. I went over the engine about four times before I got most of the dirt off it. And there wasn't that much dirt on it in the first place, I just kept missing bits. But eventually, it's starting to look a lot cleaner. Thankfully, most of the engine parts are not rusty. This would have been a terrible job if all the parts were covered in rust. There is one thing that's bothering me, and it bothered me when I first saw the photographs of the engine, and that is how far the flywheel is stuck out, perched right on the end of the crankshaft. I think I'm going to kill two birds with one stone here. I'm going to remove the flywheel, which is secured to the shaft just using one slot-headed grub screw. I will be changing all the grub screws on the engine for Allen cap head type. And that also includes these very small slot-headed grub screws that secure the eccentric sheave onto the crankshaft. These nearly always break, or they do when I go into obsess mode when I'm setting the timing. And on this engine, there are three lots of timings to set. Now the flywheel's been removed, there's more room, so I'm just cleaning the eccentrics at the end. The final thing to do is to give the engine yet another blow-over with the airline. This dries off all the solvent and blasts away any stubborn pieces of dirt. And don't forget, when evaporating solvent at this rate, you must do it in a very well-ventilated area. I have all the doors in the workshop wide open. The best way to clean up the flywheel is to mount it on a shaft in the lathe and spin it. It's a long way from the chuck, this is a health and safety thing. Now the flywheel is spinning, it's far easier to clean it. I'm just using wet or dry sandpaper, this is 400 grit. 
After the wet or dry sandpaper, I finish off the job with some Scotch Brite, and now it looks okay. One small point, a credit to the engineer who built this engine, just look how true this flywheel is running. You will notice that when I clean the inside edges, I never put my fingers all the way in there, I fold the sandpaper. A quick final clean up using some Scotch Brite, and it's time to fit the flywheel back to the engine. This image shows the engine sat on the bench just as I received it, and it's in quite good mechanical condition. Maybe I can see things that other people miss. Have you noticed that the cylinder isn't shaped properly on the left hand side at the top? And also, I can see that there aren't any gaskets fitted anywhere on the engine. And I think there's a sheared stud on the low pressure steam chest cover. And also, I noticed that there are some very tiny blowholes in both of the steam chest cover castings. I think what I'll do first is oil up the engine, because I'm going to see whether or not it runs. It's quite interesting to think that the original builder probably did exactly the same as this many years ago. I'm being quite thorough with the oil, and I'm trying not to miss anything. I did miss a couple of the eccentrics, but I went back later to do them. In fact, in this part of the clip, I'm doing it now. With any type of engine that has moving parts, lubrication is very important. And more so with the steam engine because the working parts are exposed and it's a total loss oil system. The motion work on this engine is very well made and by motion work I mean every part that moves. And on a triple expansion engine a lot of the parts move. Some of them are inside the engine and you can't see them. So it's very important to make sure that the cylinders are very well lubricated. I've just found another part I've missed. I cannot stress how important it is to make sure everything that moves has a coating of oil. The only way I can oil the cylinders currently is to inject some oil into the steam chest of the high pressure cylinder. This oil will find its way from the high pressure cylinder to the intermediate cylinder and then to the low pressure cylinder. I'm curious to see whether the engine runs and the only way I can find this out is to connect my compressed air line and supply the engine with some air. A triple expansion engine is not self-starting, but in this clip I'm not trying to start it. With the airline attached, I'm trying to make sure that the oil goes through all three cylinders. All the valve gear is completely loose and not fixed in place. So I think I have to find a way of holding the drop arms in place to see whether it runs or not. I found a piece of mahogany which I could put behind two of the drop arms but it wouldn't slide in all the way along because the drop arm that connects to the reversing mechanism was in the way. I turned the pressure of the compressed air up to 40 pounds per square inch and here I'm trying to make it go. Unfortunately it doesn't run because the valve timing is incorrect. It nearly goes but not quite. When I push the drop arms the other way to put it into reverse it doesn't even try so the valve timing is well out. To be honest, I really was expecting far too much. It would have been nice had it have roared into life, but alas not. This missing stud looks ominous. I've not been inside it, but if I was a gambling man, I would say that the stud has sheared off in the cylinder block. When I push a small bolt into the hole, it stops dead when it should go into the cylinder. Drilling out these small 7BA studs is a real pain. The steel that they're made from is actually quite hard. I'll show the repair process in a later episode. What's this? The engine suddenly started working. In this clip you can clearly see how loose the valve gear is. Each and every one of the drop arms needs to be fixed to the main rod and the fun part will be securing the drop arms to the rod. I have my small Bosch electric drill firmly clamped to the crankshaft and I'm rotating the engine to allow the oil to find its way through all of the cylinders. Here you can see what's turning the engine and I tightened the chuck so it didn't mark the crankshaft and you can see how much effort it's taking to remove it. Earlier on I mentioned about blow holes in the steam chest cover castings and here are the ones in the steam chest cover of the low pressure cylinder. This is purely cosmetic but it's bothering me. In the fullness of time I will probably make a new steam chest cover for this end using this one as a pattern. The engine was sent to me by a kind viewer from the USA and here are a few details that accompanied it. Stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists.
and by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.